as we pursue Jesus, one of the most important things that we need to learn is how to hear his voice. We have to learn how to hear his voice. It is not uh, um, something that, that's negotiable. Throughout the ages, the theologians call them dispensations. They have basically been, most theologians agree, there have been three dispensations. Three ages how God spoke to men and women or worked with humanity in certain ways. First dispensation was um, the patriarchs, where God worked through specific families to bring his message across and to change the families. And then the second dispensation was uh, the dispensation of the law and the prophets and the temple and the priesthood. How God used priests and the temple to show people who he was. But the final dispensation and the final way that God works with us and the one that we are in now is the dispensation of the gospel where God speaks to us to all people, not just to one nation, but to all people through the gospel and through the person of Jesus, right? Through everything that Jesus has done, we are now in the age of the gospel. That's how God deals with us. But through, no matter how God dealt with people or humanity throughout the ages, there's always been one thing that's been a non-negotiable. If you look at Moses, if you look at Abraham, if you look at Isaac and Jacob, if you look at Jesus, if you look at the apostles, there's one thing that's always been a non-negotiable. It is hearing the voice of the Lord. It's such a big emphasis that so many of us my son, brave, as you know, he's got Down syndrome, heavy as a rock, my goodness, when he sees me, he just wants to wrestle, rah, rah, and then, and then he roars, but one of the most difficult things for us, or for me as a parent, is he doesn't talk yet, and you know, when someone can't speak when they're 18 or 19 or 20, there's something not right, correct, there was, he was born deaf, we had to get an earpiece for him. God healed that completely, so now he doesn't wear the earpiece. Now he hears us perfectly well, and now he just hears like a man. Just listens when he wants to, right? <laughs> <laughs> if a Christian does not hear the voice of God, there's something wrong. We are made, Jesus, through his death on the cross, opening up for us the moment he resurrected, making a way for us into the throne room. Hebrews says that all of us can now boldly come to the throne of grace because of Jesus. We don't need mediators. We don't need priests, right? We can boldly come, you and I, into the presence of God, and we can talk to Jesus. Jesus made a way for you and I to talk to him, to connect to, with him, to, to hear his voice. It is in our makeup to know the voice of God, to recognize his voice, to hear his voice, and to obey his voice. In Exodus, Moses speaks to the people. God gives him the Ten Commandments, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to go up to the mountain. But God is inviting all of us to go up to the mountain of the Lord where his presence will be. Look at what they say. Where am I? Yes. See, I've got the clicky, clicky thing. Exodus 20, verse 18 and 19. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blasts of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, what a beautiful English word, billowing. If you're an Afrikaans and you don't know what that means, when your husband farts, that's a billowing from the mountain. <laughs> when they heard all these things, they stood at a distance. This is the Israelites. And they started trembling with fear. God invited them up to the mountain to encounter him, to be in his presence. Verse 19. And they said to Moses, you, Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. God gives them an opportunity to be in his presence, to hear directly from him. What do they choose? They choose the inferior. They choose a man instead of the creator. So many of us today, many of us as followers of Jesus, we rather hear what a man says instead of what our Creator says. We choose the inferior. And then we wonder why we are struggling. 
Not because God doesn't like you. In fact, God is saying to everyone this morning, you can hear me. I want you to hear me. And I've been talking to you the whole time. It's just about tuning into that frequency. So, the one requirement that we always have as a follower of Jesus is the requirement to hear the voice of God. It's not to make the most money in the world, although God is not against money. It's not, a, it's not to have all the orphanages in the world and feed a million people in the world. Is that a good thing? Yes, God's not against it. But one of the requirements for us as a follower of Jesus, last week we spoke about the one thing about His presence. Now another requirement that He wants for us is to hear His voice. Now, here's the question. Why is God speaking so important? Good question, right? Pastor, hey, well done. Well done. Very, thank you for pointing out the obvious. Why is God speaking so important? Two reasons. Because there's always a promise connected to hearing God's voice. And hearing the voice of God is always a mark of His people. Shelley, happy birthday. We love you. Yes, we love you. Happy birthday. We appreciate you. God loves you. Come, let me pray for you. Is this okay? Yes. Just flowing with Jesus. Come, Shelley. Come. Can we stretch out our hands? Anyone else's birthday today? In case I don't know. And don't lie. Right? <laughs> Just because you want a prayer, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Touch me. <Ooh>, okay. <laughs> right? Father God, thank you for Shalene's life. Thank you that you love her, Lord. Lord, I pray that the year ahead will be even greater and bigger than ever before. Lord, we pray that she will know your voice. And she will walk with you like Adam walked with you in the Garden of Eden. That she will have fellowship with you like Jesus has fellowship with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray, show her Jesus. Make her more like Jesus. Help her to fall deeper in love with Jesus. And Father, I thank you for the salvation of her family and of her friends and of the generations that will come after her. Thank you, Lord, that she is a light in the city, Lord, because of you. Bless her, Lord. Bless her out of her socks. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. We love you. So, why do we need to hear the voice of God? Why is it important? Because there's always a blessing attached. And number two, it's a mark of His people. Let's look at the first one. God's promises are always connected to hearing and obeying. Hearing and obeying. Let me show you. Exodus 15 verse 26. So He said, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, I'm going to look there. If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in His sight, obeying His commands and keeping all His decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord. So let's, let's see what the Bible says. Right? Let's not be like some of those preachers out there, only want to point out the nice things. <laughs> Here's what the Bible is saying. Many of us are sick because we don't listen to the voice of God. And it's not because God brings it on us. It's because when we don't hear the voice of God, we are inviting other voices to speak into our lives. And that can bring curses. Whew. So what is the requirement of the blessing? The voice of the Lord. Do you know that the Israelites walked in the desert and they didn't get sick because God is with them. They listened to His voice. How crazy is that? Next verse. So people don't just say, oh, Pastor, you take one verse and pull the theology out of it. No, next verse. Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Know therefore, if you will indeed, what's the word? Obey. Okay, when you see that word, okay, don't worry. Obey. When you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. I love you, Sia. Daddy loves you. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This verse, again, the parallel of this verse is in Peter, where Peter writes and he says, You are a chosen 
generation, a royal priesthood. So there's a parallel again. But here's what Jesus is saying. Okay, in order to be that, there's a requirement. What is the requirement? Obey. How do we obey his voice? By listening to him, to him speak. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, if you haven't read the Bible, is a hectic book. 28 verse 1 to Now it shall be, if you diligently listen to me and obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you pray, if you pay attention to what? To the voice of the Lord. Okay. The requirement of the blessing is obeying and listening to voice. Now look at this. Look at what happens in the Old Testament when, we de- when they didn't obey. Verse 15. But it shall come about if you do not listen to and obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And let me just pause there for a moment. But Pastor, we don't live in the Old Testament, we live in the New Testament. Jesus became the curse for me so I can no longer be cursed. Yes, Jesus became the curse for us. But two things can be true at the same time, right? If you are a Christian, what is some of the fruit of the Christian? We obey and listen to his voice. So, If I don't obey and listen to his voice, then there's evidence that suggests that I might not be a follower of Jesus. So then what are we doing? We are inviting this thing to come into our house. It is like you're having your gate open at night. It's like nothing will happen to us. You have the gate open. Your door is unlocked. Everything's unlocked. Like, just come. Just come in. I welcome you. Nothing will happen. Do you see how important it is to listen to the voice of the Lord? To hear his voice. Many of us are in financial difficulty because we made our own decision instead of listening to Jesus. Many of us are carrying heartache, did things with people we shouldn't have done, go places we shouldn't have gone, bought things with money we didn't have to impress people we don't like because we didn't listen and obey his voice. Come on, let's be real. And then he's so quickly, oh, but God, God, I thought you loved me. He does. But the best way God can love, or one of the best ways that God loves us is by saying, listen, I want you to obey my voice. I want you to listen. And the reason why God wants us to obey his voice is because listening to his voice is a sign of intimacy. So it brings us back to last week. It's intimacy. Rejecting his voice is rejecting his face, which means you are rejecting an intimate relationship with him. And it's all about relationship with Jesus. It's all about that. Crazy verses, right? So the first reason why it's important is because there's a blessing attached to hearing the voice of the Lord. But the second thing is, Hearing the voice of the Lord is a mark of a true follower of Jesus. Look at what Jesus said in John 10, 27. My sheep, listen, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They know my voice, and they follow me. My sheep, listen, they listen, they follow him, they hear him, he knows them. Pastor A, I love Jesus, I'm following Jesus, okay, are you listening to him? A foolish husband does not listen to his wife. A foolish person does not listen to the counsel of wise people. Foolish children do not listen to their parents. Parents, I thought I'd get a big hand clap there. Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord. Still hurting from the wife part. (laughs) If we expect that of our kids, our Heavenly Father expects that of us. Because He loves us. See here, God is not out there shouting and screaming and running after us with a whip like, you shall, you shall. No, no. They, just like a shepherd doesn't drive the sheep. A shepherd is in front of the sheep and he guides the sheep with his voice. And we follow him. 
It is impossible to follow if we do not listen. Many of us are following the wrong voices. We are following what Oprah is saying. We are following what CNN is saying. We are following what culture and society is saying, right? And then we wonder why society is in such a mess. Because we're not following the lover of our soul. We're not following Jesus. He's the one we should follow. Okay, now, here's the other question. Cool past day, but how does God actually speak? Teach me how does God speak. God speaks in many ways, but let me give you three predominant ways he speaks. Like I said, God can speak in dreams. He speaks mostly to me in dreams. Dreams, visions, um, through words of knowledge, God can speak to us through impressions. An impression can be often um, you'll talk to someone and all of a sudden you'll, get, you'll feel a pain in your body and you're not sore there at all. Nothing has happened. And then you speak to the person like, hey, listen, I've got pain in my back. Say, is there something wrong? It's like, no, there's something wrong with my back. It's an impression that God places on us so that we can pray for that person. How many of you would like to know more of that? Right? It's cool. It's amazing. God is like, he's talking the whole time. We must just tune in. Listening to God is the greatest adventure ever. It's the greatest adventure because he makes you, he, no, not he makes you. <laughs> he can if he wants to, but he doesn't. But he challenges us in so many different ways to step out of the boat. And often we step out of the boat and it wasn't his voice, then we drown. Some of us dated the wrong people because we listened to the wrong voices. Some of us went into debt because we listened to the wrong voices. So, Paul say, how do I know how God speaks? How do we know it's his voice? The first thing is the written word. The second one is the spoken word. And the last one is the revealed word. The written word, <clears throat> can, theologians define the written word as logos. Greek word, logos. Now, logos is a big concept, but I'm going to try and just bring it down for us. Logos is the divine counsel, the divine will, the divine intellect, the mind the divine uh, 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 strategy and function of the king. It is total governance. Whatever he says goes. It was settled in heaven forever. It's unchanging. It doesn't change. It's forever. Okay? It's the divine counsel and will and total purposes of God. It doesn't change. It, was, it, it exists outside of time and space. It's because of God's divine counsel that he created time and space. Is that making sense? So that doesn't change. And that word is the word logos. And it refers often to the written word. Look what the Bible says here. Paul writes to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture, the written word, is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. See, you don't always need people to tell you that you do something wrong. You just need the Bible. Right? So the reason why many of us the reason why many of us think there are multiple sexualities is because we don't know the word. Because the word is there to equip us, to correct us, to inform us, to teach us, to show us. It is the logos. It is the divine counsel of God. It was established before everything. The reason why many of us justify sin is because we don't know the word. And what does sin do? Sin kills Sin destroys. God isn't anti having fun. He's just anti you dying and me dying. He wants us to live. Now, every word that you receive, and we'll get to this in a bit later, the written word, the logos, has to be our foundation that we filter every voice through. But we'll get to that. So we have got the written word. Then we have the spoken word. The spoken word is the rhema. It is the spoken word of God. Often the spoken word of God, 9 out of 10, comes from the Logos. 
And God gives us the rhema because the logos is too big for us to comprehend in our infinite minds, in our finite minds, right? So God rhemas the logos to us on a daily basis so that we can understand from Scripture, Scripture, He gives us a rhema, a revealed word from the written word. Is that making sense? Is this too deep this morning? Give me a cap. Okay. Jesus speaks and He says, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word, the word there in the Greek is rhema, that comes from the mouth of God. What is Jesus saying? Our sustenance is not just food. Our spiritual sustenance is literally receiving a rhema, daily rhema word from the Lord. The way that we grow in our relationship with God is by sitting down with Him and listening for the rhema word. God, because we don't want to eat yesterday's bread, right? It's stale. That Albany can go all very quickly, you know? Like, Bleh. have you ever had stale bread? It's disgusting. Many of us still live on word and bread that we received 10 years ago. And God is like, no, no, I want to give you fresh bread, fresh revelation coming from the mouth of God. So what is supposed to sustain us in a walk with God? His word, his word, his spoken word. Third thing, that the third way God speaks is through His revealed Word. And who is His revealed Word? It's Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. So we've got the Logos, the written Word. We've got the spoken Word, which is Rhema. And now we've got the revealed Word, which is Jesus. So if you read the Scripture, the written Word, and you struggle to understand it, or you get a Rhema Word and you're not sure what it means, you always go back to the revealed word. You always go back to Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus, Jesus is the personification of Logos. Jesus is the divine counsel of God. Jesus is the total plan of God. Everything that you know about the Father, all the plans, all the, all the fullness of everything that God wants is found in the person of Jesus. This is why we always say, look to Jesus. Point to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Hear from Jesus. So often we struggle to, okay, how do I interpret the scripture? What is the context here? I don't know what he's saying. Okay, if anything that you read in the scripture, you do not find in the person of Jesus, you have a reason to doubt. Because he is the revealed word of God. So Jesus says this. Oh, <laughs> next one, sorry. <laughs> John 1, but thank you, thank you. Speak your Lord, oh, well. Let's see. Friends like those. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, one of my favorite passages, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Who is that? Jesus. So how do I know when God speaks? Written Word. God will speak to us through the written Word, Scripture. He will speak to us through Rhema, literally sitting down every day, waiting, listening for Him to speak. And then through the revealed Word, Jesus. Everything always comes back to Jesus. You still here? Are you learning something? This will change your life. This will change your life. So Paul say, how can I be sure it is God speaking? Because we have to filter it, right? How do I filter what I'm hearing? Is it just a demon? Is it my own flesh? Is it the world? Is it my uh, in-laws that I don't really like and they're pressuring me to do something? You know, your mother-in-law. They're just saying, might isn't here. I can say that. I do love my mother-in-law. Vicky, just tell her that. Okay. <laughs> how do we filter things through? When I hear something, how do I filter it? First, you always filter it through the written word. If you hear something and you do not find it in the Bible, God will never contradict the written word. He doesn't mind contradicting our understanding of it because often we, we think we understand something, right? And they go like, eh, you're missing it there, son. Go back and you read it, read it. Oh, this is what it means. Eh, that's not what it means. Read again. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. Right? So whatever voice you hear, you filter it through the written word. For example, a family member of mine came to me once. And they're like, God told me to divorce my wife. I'm not as sure that's God. It's like, no, no, I heard it. And this preacher is doing this and this. I'm like... Show me in the Bible. No, it's not there. It's not there, right? 
So you filter everything through the written word. Psalm 119 verse 105. There's no slide. I'm just quoting it. What does it say? It says, your word is a a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So in order to walk the path that God has called us on, we need the word to illuminate our path. So I hear the rhema word of God. It's my bread. Okay. And now I hear the voice or I hear this voice or my insecurities. Insecurity speaks very loud. Fear speaks very loud. I've got to filter it through the written word. Lord, I'm hearing this. What does your word say? Okay. Second thing that you can do is you look at the revealed word. You look at Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. If you've seen me, Jesus said in John 14, you've seen the Father. So if there's passages in the word, let's say, let's take a, a, an interesting topic that I list that I hear about almost every week. Women are not allowed to preach. <laughs> That's rubbish. But there's two scriptures, okay? That, great. Okay, you found a biblical basis for it. Fantastic. Okay. Now, the second principle of inter interpretation is the Bible interprets the Bible. So we can't just take two verses and rip it out of context because that's how the apartheid regime did what? Justified apartheid. They used the Bible. So you can't just take something out of context. You've got to look at something in the context. So now I look at the Bible. I look at Genesis 2 maps. Look at what the Bible says about women teaching, women preaching, right? And I'm like, oh, goodness, God has used women in every era, Old Testament and New Testament. In fact, the first, the first woman that God spoke to, the woman at the well, she was the first evangelist. What? She went and told everyone about him. In fact, when Jesus resurrected from the grave, who were the first people to see him? The women, who were the first people to tell them that he's alive? She, women, right? And then you start seeing one of the apostles was a woman. One of the house churches was led from Paul by a? Thank you. You're getting this. Why a woman? <laughs> so now, now we're like, okay, but I've got this verse. I think I heard it. But now let's look at all of this. Pastor, sure. Pastor, I am still not sure. Okay, now let's look at Jesus. Let's try and find it in the life of Jesus. Because Jesus is? Perfect theology. Did he empower women? Did he equip women? Did women go and speak in his ministry? Evangelize under? Yes. That's just one explanation, right? So, if you hear, how do you filter it? Through the written word, through Jesus. And the third one, this is pretty important, is through confirmation of circumstances. If you hear a word, you are allowed to ask God, God, give me circumstances. Show me my circumstances. I want to have a confirmation from you. Again, how do I know this, Pastor? I give me a scripture. Well done. You're learning very quickly. Where is it in the written word? That's what you're supposed to say. Okay? <laughs> Jeremiah. Well, as a bullfrog. <laughs> Jeremiah, he gets this dream. Listen to what he says. Jeremiah 32, verse 69. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. This is in a dream. Hamal, son of Shalom, your uncle is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anatos, because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Then, just as the Lord has said, look at the confirmation of circumstances. My cousin, Hamal, came to me in the courtyard of the garden and said, hey, buy the field. That enough, anotos, whatever. In the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. This was his conclusion. I knew that it was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field. So, here's my advice. Don't just take, ever take one confirmation. For example, you're like, should I buy that BMW? Such a nice car. Lord, yeah. Lord, give me a confirmation. And then someone comes to you. First of all, God didn't speak to you, right? Look at, what, look at the order here. First, God speaks. And then the, conf then the circumstances are confirmed. You're not, you don't go and look for confirmation from circumstances first. Like, oh, Lord, I just saw BMW drive past me on the highway. It's a sign. It's a sign. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have more than one type of confirmation. Go into the Word. God. Okay, speak to me. Okay, there, I saw this, I saw this. Speak to me, Lord. Okay, so that's confirmation of circumstances. And then the last one, oh, was confirmation through people. 
And God often works like this. If you're in a church, it'll be your pastors and your leaders. Listen to me. Pastors and leaders aren't there to control your life. But if they're spiritful, they love Jesus. It is a wise thing. The Bible shows us to go to your leader. Say, listen, this is what I'm thinking. I'm not sure. I don't know. Let's pray about it. Let's fast together. Let's seek God together for this. So God uses our pastors and our leaders for that. Then people, your spouses, husbands, it's a stupid man who doesn't listen to his wife. Remember that one? Let's go back to that one. Yes? Uh, wives, wives, it's a good thing to listen to your husbands as well. Right? God uses our spouses. Yeah, yeah. It goes quiet every time I mention those things. <laughs> it's like, I don't like this church, man. <laughs> Kids, God can use our parents. And if, if you've got godly parents, parents that really love you, they will tell you the things that you don't want to hear. One of the safe marks that we have in our home is always go to Jesus first. Look at the word. Study the word. Then I make myself accountable. Maybe this is what I hear God is saying. Can you pray with me? I go to my pastor. Pastor, this is what I'm thinking. I don't know. I've got blind spots. What do you think? Pray with me. A wise king always surrounds himself with wise people. Yeah? Because you've got blind spots. Too many times the things are the devil. We attribute the things of the devil to the voice of the Lord. Oh, Jesus doesn't say anything about hell. I just heard God say to me, hell isn't applicable in our lives anymore. Here's something I heard this week from a pastor right here in Centurion. Uh, we don't need repentance for salvation. Rewind. You know, sometimes you can just miss something. So I listen to the whole thing. I'm like, what? That does not sound like the voice of the Lord right there, right? So, how do I know? How do I fall to the voice of the written word, the revealed word, confirmation of circumstances, and confirmation of people? Now, very important. It is important that we position ourselves to hear. Because if I just go through my day and say, Jesus, tell me if this is you, and then I walk on, I'm not positioning myself to hear. When you're sitting in front of someone, if it's your spouse, if you are trying to talk to them and they are busy with sorts of things, how do you feel? Doesn't feel good, right? So what do you do like, baby? Can we sit down? Can we have a chat? And we talk to each other. So how do I position myself to hear from the Lord? Three things. We need to have a hearing heart. We need to give God our undivided attention. And we need to have an attitude of humility. I read this crazy verse. Absolutely intense verse about a hearing heart. King Solomon, he prays, and he says this. He says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. Again, a dream. God speaks in dreams. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. How many of you want that dream? Yes? Like, yes, yes. Ask whatever you want me to give you. This was Solomon's reply. Now, O Lord my God. You have made your servant a king in place of my father, David. But I'm only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart. That word discerning in the Hebrew means a, a heart that hears, a hearing heart, to govern your people. And to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. Jesus would often say, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He would say it often when he spoke. Now think about this logically. In order for him to say that, they have had to hear. So he wasn't talking about their physical ears. Jesus was speaking about the same thing that Solomon is speaking about here. 
It's about our inner heart being sensitive to the voice of the Lord. And God will speak into our hearts in here on the inside. And what Solomon is asking is, is Lord, my whole being, my, my mind, my will, my intellect, all my desires, Lord, I give that to you. Use that to speak to me. Let my desires line up with your desires. Let my will line up with your will. Let my wants and needs line up with your wants and needs. That's what he's saying. He's saying because I can't do what you have called me to do. And he speaks about the heart. So this week, the whole week, guess what I prayed? This prayer. Like, Lord. And then after I prayed, I'm like, yeah, God is pleased with me. Yes. And then the Holy Spirit is like, oh, humility, humility. <laughs> Why is the heart so important? Well, the same Solomon who asked for this prayer, who asked for this, wrote this in the book of Proverbs, 4 verse 23. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So what is Solomon saying? Solomon is saying, listen, our heart is actually deceitful. And if it doesn't become a hearing heart, a heart that's totally surrendered to Holy Spirit, it will ruin our lives. Because through our heart, our heart represents the way we think, our feelings. Too many of us are led by our feelings. We have too many people who are so sensitive these days. That's another sermon, right? They're like, oh, it hurt my feelings when you looked at me. What? Right? Solomon is saying, whatever's going on in here determines the course of your life. So he prayed, it's like, God, let this thing, let my heart, the way I think, the way my feelings, my emotions, let everything, my entire being line up with you. I want to hear you. I, I want to know you. I want to. This is such a deep prayer. And God is saying, listen, we're in his presence. He wants us to pray this. Lord, give me a hearing heart. Because he wants us to know his voice. The opposite of a hearing heart, the opposite of a sensitive heart, is what? A calloused heart, a hardened heart. Psalm 95, verse 7 and 8. If only you would listen to his voice today, again, the voice of the Lord. The Lord says, don't harden your heart. So how do we stop listening to the Lord when we harden our hearts? When we don't want to hear what we need to hear from the Lord. Like, no, uh, uh, I know more. Uh, uh, um, this book is ancient. I don't need to listen. It's mythology. I don't need to. I can just follow the, my feelings and what society says. And God is saying, no, no, don't, don't let your heart be hardened. Often we harden our heart because of pain. Because of our experiences. And God says, forgive that person. Like, no, there's no way. And we harden our hearts. And because of the things that we went through in our childhood, our hearts have been so hardened and calloused, it's difficult to raise our kids. And then we become the person we didn't want to be when we grew up. Right? Don't harden your hearts, as Israel did in the wilderness. How do we harden our hearts? When we are not willing to bow down and to hear Him. If we don't have a spirit of humility. Second and the third one is this. Undivided attention. In order to position yourself to hear from the Lord, you have to give undivided attention and you need to have an attitude of humility. Proverbs 5.1 My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Attend means my focus, my, my desire. I'm not getting distracted by anything else. I'm focusing all my time and effort on this one thing, to hear the voice of the Lord. So attend unto my wisdom, my voice, and bow down low, humility, to my understanding. So when we speak to God, we don't come with preconceived ideas. We don't come with things that we think he needs to say. But we come with a heart of like, God, this is what I think. 
but you are my Lord and you are my creator. And like David, we pray, search my heart, O Lord. Search me. See if there's anything in here that you don't like. And we come down and we, we bow low because we are the created thing. We are not the creator. We are not the, the, the hero in the story of salvation, church. He is. Many of us, when we, we're almost done, I want us to, in a moment, just to go back into worship and just practically apply this. Often, we want to pray, or we pray, we open the Word, and then all of a sudden, our mind goes everywhere, right? It's crazy. We think about dinner. We think about the fight that you just had with someone. You think about the sale that you need to make, and you're focusing on everything else except right now attending and bowing low to hear from the Lord. What do we do in that moment? David gives us the answer. He speaks to himself. So when you read this in the Hebrew, he's literally telling himself, his soul. He says, my soul. He's addressing his soul. What is our soul? Our mind, our will, our intellect, and our emotions. That's often what comes in the way when we try and be still, right? And he's like, soul, mind, shut up, be quiet. Wait only, he's telling himself, soul, wait on God. And silently submit to him. For my hope and my expectations are from him. He's talking to himself. When you talk to yourself, it doesn't mean you're crazy. Sometimes you have to talk to yourself. Some of us are so good at talking to ourselves that we are our worst enemy. We speak more curses and more death over ourselves than what God speaks over us with life and blessing. And here David is saying, no, soul, soul, keep quiet. And I often do this when I start and I worship and I go down and man, everything is just crazy. The kids just puked. There's a dirty diaper. Uh, an adult had a dirty diaper emotionally, right? And you're like, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. I just want to focus. And I'm like, ah, Holy Spirit, I command my body, my soul right now to fall in line with you, Holy Spirit. Now quiet down. This is what you need to do. Because there's a war. If hearing the voice of God is so important, why do you think the enemy tries to stop us from getting to him? Because there's life. There's life. So let me sum all of this up. How do we do this, Pastor? How do I bow low? How do I get into this attitude of humility and listening and position myself to hear from the Lord? One word. The thing that does this the best out of everything is worship. Worship is not about us. I don't care which pastor taught you what. The written word says worship is about him. If we sing worship songs, but it's all about me, guess who I'm exalting? Me. But worship is about Him. So what does worship do? It brings me low. It brings me in front of my Creator. And I'm positioning myself to hear. And I'm putting my focus on Him. This is why Sunday mornings are so important, church. Oh, I don't like that song. Oh, that speaker was too loud. Oh, that woman didn't sing. No, that, that's, that's the devil. Now I'm going to focus on him because I want to hear from him. I want to know him. This is what it says. Psalm 95 is 1 to 7. Come, let us sing to the Lord. So what is worship? Singing. Oh, I don't sing. It's not my culture. Worship is singing. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. If you can't sing, that's why God put it in there. Shout. Can't sing, shout. I can't sing. <laughs> Let us come to him with thanksgiving. We enter his gates and his courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. This is worship, singing, shouting, thanksgiving, giving him praise. Why do we do that? For the Lord is great. Not Antoine is great. Not Divan is great. Not Brenda. No, he's great. He's the greatest king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depth of the earth. Think about it. And we take it so lightly. He holds a depth. We haven't even discovered yet the depth of the earth. He holds it in his hands. And the mightiest mountains, the sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our maker. So what's part of worshiping? 
going low, going on our knees, bowing down, sitting on the floor, just looking at him. Oh no, I'm too proud, too proud to go and manage. Oh, that's a problem. And then you want a breakthrough, but you're not willing to go low because you're exalting yourself about Jesus. And this morning, Jesus is saying, no, no, I want you to hear my voice because you're my child. And I want blessings for your life. I want you to make the right decisions in your life for your family, for your children. I want you to know me because rejecting my voice is rejecting my face.